Yeah. Um, there's a half right there that for you. Okay, so today we're doing like polynomial stuff, so um, long division, transformation review, shifts, stretches, and all that good stuff, inverses, and then <coughs> systems and three variables. We're just going to jump right into, um, let's see here. You have, I mean, you have the packet in front of you, but we're going to jump right into uh, having a cubic expression with three integer zeros on the interval from negative 10 to 10. Okay, here's our cubic polynomial. First, talking about n behavior. Okay, so even in odd functions, this is an odd because it has a degree of 3. And again, if you don't want to write everything down, don't worry about it if you'd rather just sit and listen because again you can always go back on the video and relook at something um, but n behavior is all based on odd and then obviously the leading coefficient here is a positive so I give my kids um, four kind of little graphs with odd n behavior the the um, n behavior is opposite of each other so we could start low and high or start high and low so both of those are odd sort of behavior, and you can have as many fluctuations in the middle as you want. As far as whether or not one's positive odd or negative odd, I talk about slope. So the overall slope of this is that it's increasing the entire time. So this is a positive odd, and the overall slope of this one is a negative, so it's a negative odd degree polynomial. Um, for even, I talk about it being like kind of a bowl shape. So it could be as simple as a quadratic, which is x squared, so to the second power is obviously even. Um, or it could have, you know, f a few fluctuations inside there, and that's even. Just like parabolas, okay, so just like a parabola, if this opens up, it's a positive even. And if something opens down, it's a negative even. So that's the main thing. So when it says describe the end behavior, you could describe it in words and say, because this is a positive odd, it starts coming from negative infinity and ends going towards infinity. Or you can do it symbolically. You can say, as x approaches negative infinity, f of x is also approaching negative infinity. And as x is approaching positive infinity, so we're going along the graph this way, f of x is also approaching positive infinity. Now, I put these two questions side by side. The next question is, is the function even, odd, or neither? That's different than having an even degree or an odd degree, okay? Does anyone remember the difference between having an even degree versus being an even function? Or having an odd degree versus being an odd function? You're not talking to me. You don't remember? <laughs> yeah? Even it can be reflected over the y-axis. Correct. And if it's odd, it can be reflected over the origin. Correct. So the odd degree, the degree stuff is all about end behavior. Whether or not the function is even or odd, I would type in the function, and I'm going to do it quickly, x to the third power, and you look at symmetry. That's 31x plus 120. And I'm going to have to turn that light on quickly. We look at symmetry, and if it's symmetrical to the y-axis, it's even. If it's symmetrical to the odd, or if it's symmetrical to the origin, which means it looks the same right side up as it does upside down. Now, this is a negative 10 to 10 window, which is terrible. I, it went down, and I missed a bunch of the graph, and then it flew back up, and I missed a bunch of the graph. So I need to go up and down quite a bit more. Um, so on my y-axis, I'll go from negative 100 to 100 and see what happens. Still not enough, but better, right? And it's not perfect, but it's good enough. Is it perfectly symmetrical to the y-axis? No, so it's not even. Is it the same exact graph right side up as it is upside down? It would have to be exactly the same. Now keep in mind, 
that they're both going from negative 100 to, or the y is going from negative 100 to 100. The, it's going to reach a maximum somewhere, but it's off my screen. It's definitely higher than 100 then that that means, right? And when I flip it upside down, that peak is lower than 100, so it is not symmetrical to the origin. It's not exactly, there's a similarity, I will say, up right side up and upside down, but it's not exactly the same. <coughs> so this would be neither. So neither, we'll circle neither, and I'll just take a little note there that even means symmetrical to the x-axis, or y-axis rather, I'm sorry, and odd means symmetrical to the origin, <coughs> which again is <coughs> looking the same right side up as upside down. There's a, there's a, an algebraic way of doing it too, where you plug in negative x. If you plug in negative x and you get the exact same thing back as the original function, then it's even. So next to this even, I'm also going to write, like, if f of negative x, if when I plug in a negative x, it equals the original function after I simplify it all out, that's another way of being even. If when I plug in negative x, I get the opposite of the original function once I simplify. So f of negative x equals negative f of x, that's being odd. And if neither of those things happen, then it's neither. So if I take this function and plug in negative x, I'm going to get negative x cubed minus 6 times negative x squared minus 31 times negative x plus 120. And when I simplify that out, I'm going to get negative x cubed minus 6x squared plus 31x plus 120. And if you compare that to the original, it's not an exact match, so it's not even. And it's not exactly the opposite. Some of the signs are opposite, but not all of them. So it's not 100% the opposite, and therefore it's not even either. And that would be the algebraic way of backing up that it's neither. Okie doke. All right. So big, big difference there. Even an odd degree versus even an odd function. They're, they are two very different concepts, okay? Using technology to determine a zero, just, I'm sure you guys are fine with this, but just second trace, and then you're looking for zero, and then we're going to bring our cursor. That on the bottom always tells you where your cursor is, so right now I don't see mine. That's because it's at negative 1, 149, so it's off my screen. But at least the bottom tells you where it is, so that you can scroll left or right, and then it comes into view. So I want the left bound to be to the left of that zero, hit enter. Then right bound be to the right of that zero, hit enter, hit enter. And then it's going to give you one of your zeros, negative five zero. Okay? So x equals negative five. Now, part D says using the information from part A, factor the polynomial. So when we factor something that has four terms, okay, you probably all look to grouping, right? Do you all go to grouping? Okay. Um, if it's, a, you know, you look for a GCF. If it's a binomial, you look for the difference of perfect squares. If it's a trinomial, you look to guess and check. If it's four terms, you look to group. If something is not groupable, that doesn't mean it's not factorable. It just means it's not factorable by that method of grouping, okay? Long division is the least efficient way of factoring. Long division, though, is a way of factoring. So if they told you to factor this algebraically, the reason we did the previous part is to give us a factor that we know goes into it. If negative 5 is a 0, what's the factor? X plus 5. So we can factor this, and, and if you look quickly, it's definitely not groupable. If I take out an x squared, I'd get, uh, I'd get x minus 6. If I took out a, I can't take out a negative 31. So right there, it's not groupable. But that, again, that doesn't mean it's not factorable. So we know it has a 0, 
And if it, it, we would assume that it says that we have to do that algebraically. Otherwise, we could factor and just say x plus 5, x minus 3, x minus whatever, 8, whatever that number is. But if it says algebraically, and we know that this is a factor, x plus 5 then should divide evenly into x cubed minus 6x squared minus 31x plus 120. When you divide something out, you are factoring. So we'd go through long division. X times what gives us X cubed? X squared. And then you'd multiply your X squared by that X cubed plus 5X squared. Do your subtraction. Negative 6 minus 5 is negative 11X squared. Bring down our 31X. X times what gives me negative 11X squared? That would be negative 11X. Multiply negative 11x times the binomial out in front, negative 11x squared minus 55x. The first term should always cancel. Negative 11 minus negative 11 does. Negative 31 minus negative 55. I'm just going to cheat because there's a double negative there, 24x. Might as well be careful and make sure you're uh, getting the right answer. We don't want to get a problem wrong because that didn't... We didn't do adding and subtracting right. And then x times 24 will give me 24x. 24x plus 120. And we get a remainder of 0, which we knew should have happened, right? Because we knew already that that was a factor. So right now, we, we're not done factoring, but we have essentially factored out an x plus 5. So we can now rewrite this as this times the quotient. So we've successfully factored this partially in x, into x plus 5 and then x squared minus 11x plus 24. And then the rest of the factoring you should be able to do by hand. I can take this quadratic and I can guess and check with it. So x minus 8x minus 3. So if you remember my graph, the graph can certainly be always used to check. Negative 5, 3, and 8 are my zeros. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and sure enough, look at the end behavior that we talked about. It was a positive odd, so it started low and ended high. So overall, it has a positive slope. And there's your positive odd. All right, just a little more on intervals where it's increasing. So now that we, let's see here. This is doing what here? Is this increasing or decreasing? Increasing. increasing. So from negative infinity up until when, I don't know. That's what I have to find out, right? So I, didn't, I haven't opened up my interval enough to see the top of this yet, but I'm about to have to because I want to see where the peak is of this graph. So I had already gone up to 100. I'm just going to go up to 200. Will that be enough? Yes. Okay. So it is increasing from negative infinity up until, and we want to find out what this x-coordinate is. So second trace, and you find your maximum. Again, it's going to ask you for the left bound. So you're telling your calculator, between this leftmost point and this rightmost point, tell me where the highest coordinate is. And it will jump right to the middle and it will tell you that it's at negative 1.78 comma 150. For an interval, anytime we're dealing with interval notation, we want x coordinates only, okay? So from negative infinity up to negative 1.78, we'll just go negative 1.8. So negative infinity, parentheses always around infinity, and then negative 1.8 will go, and is it actually increasing at that top point? No, the slope there is actually zero. It's not increasing or decreasing. So we do not want to use a bracket. We still want to use a parenthesis. And then this starts decreasing from the negative 1.8 up until we have to find out when. Second trace. This time it's a minimum we're looking for. Bring our cursor over to the left of that minimum, enter, then it asks for your right bound, bring it over to the right, enter, enter, and 5.8. So from negative 1.8 
to 5.8. It's decreasing. Oh, what did I do wrong there? Right. It's not asking for decreasing. It's asking for what interval is the function negative. So negative and, and decreasing are different things. Good. I'm glad that I, I'm actually glad I made that mistake because it <coughs> it is important. So yes, it is decreasing from here to here, but they didn't ask that. So let's just finish out the increasing. It starts increasing again. That wasn't a waste. It starts increasing again at 5.8 to infinity. So 5.8 to infinity again with parentheses. Do you guys use the little union section? Okay, good. In between your two intervals. All right. Negative means what? If the overall function is negative as opposed to decreasing, what does that mean? Yep. Below the x-axis. So it's negative down here and positive up here. So we already know our zero, so we're already going to know these answers. It's, it's below the x-axis from negative infinity up until that was negative 5, right? That was a zero of negative 5. So from negative infinity to negative 5, and again, we're not going to include negative 5 because right at negative 5, it's 0, not negative. And then it becomes negative again from 3, it's below the x-axis all the way until 8. So 3 to 8. So there's increasing and decreasing, which is slope. There's positive and negative, which is above the x-axis versus below the x-axis. Do we follow? Okay. Determine the relative max and mins. I've already, I've already done that. I'm not going to retrace trace those. It was the negative 1.8 comma something, and I didn't write down the other point. I forgot. We could rewind in the video and see what I got. Do you remember? Um, well, I have a question. Yeah. Okay, so the absolute, I wouldn't say that. We didn't get to that. So the relative is obviously any peak or valley, okay? Um, absolute would have to be the absolute highest point on the graph. And this one's not going to have one because it goes up forever. Okay? And this one's not going to have an absolute minimum because just when you think you get the lowest point, there's always this going further. But I can draw one quickly that will have an absolute max in there. So if I take um, something like this, okay? Well, I kind of get those a little close to each other. That would be, that's a relative maximum still, because it's still the top of the peak, but it also happens to be the absolute highest point that this graph ever reaches. But this one doesn't have an absolute minimum still. If I were to do this, and just kind of stop the graph here, now my absolute minimum would be negative 10, let's say, up. Okay? Really, one of the few times we look at the y-axis. Because anything in interval notation, we only look at the x-axis, but if it's what is the maximum, they're, they're, or what is the minimum, they're looking for the y-value. If they say what is the maximum point, obviously they're looking for the x and y coordinates combined. Okay? This wouldn't have a single minimum point. It has a minimum value, but if this line flattens, there's not just one single point you could get. It just has a minimum value of negative 10. Okay? Good question. Um, so, we'll, we'll move past that relative maximum. And then the, just the average rate of change from negative 2 to 1, we just know that that's slope formula, so we need to come up with the rest of the point for negative 2 and the rest of the point for an x-coordinate of 1, which you can do by hand by obviously plugging negative 2 and 1 into the original function, or you can just do second trace and use your value option, and at negative 2, you get 150. Second trace value, and at x equals 1, you get 84. So we would just do a, a slope formula with that. Okay? So 150 minus 84 over negative 2 minus 1. How many of you would have looked at the table to grab those numbers? Negative 2, 150. Would you have looked at the table? Yeah. I, I find that lots of kids really do use the table more often. The only problem I have with the table is that 
um, let's say it was like from negative 2.3, and then I know I lose a chunk of people that don't really know how to go back and change their table so that it follows the one-tenth interval. Not everyone, some of you still do, but then I lose a bunch of people. So if you always just do second trace value, you can plug in exactly what value you want and it gives you that back, okay? All right, so now we get into a, a few multiple choice questions. Um, if the point 4, negative 2 lies on the graph, which of the following points must lie on the graph of the inverse? The key concept with inverses is we flip the x's and the y's. Whether you're writing inverses, trying to draw an inverse, trying to find just a single point inverse, you flip-flop the x's and the y's. So 4, negative 2 is going to become negative 2, 4. Piecewise function, okay? What is the y-intercept? So first of all, anytime you're looking for the y-intercept, that's when x equals 0. The thing with piecewise functions is you have to approach, you can't just plug in 0 to both of them. You have to look at your intervals. We only use this first graph when x is less than negative 2. Is 0 less than negative 2? No. We use the second graph when our x's are greater than or equal to negative 2, which 0 is greater than or equal to negative 2. So we would plug 0 into this one to find our y-intercept. So 0 minus 3 is negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9. 9 minus 1 is 8. Okay. Equation of the inverse. Again, flip-flop the x's and the y's. So instead of y equals, we have x equals 4y minus 2. And then adding 2 to both sides, we get x plus 2 equals 4y. And we divide by 4 on both sides. So y equals x plus 2 over 4, which is obviously not the format exactly of the final answer. So I divide each individual term by 4. So it would be 1 fourth x plus 2 fourths, which is a half. And that would be option one. Writing linear inverses are the easiest out there. Okay? Throughout the year we have to we've had to write inverses for other types of equations as well. So the whole concept is switching those x's and y's and solving for y. So again, with inverses, if you're graphing them, just take your critical point and flip the coordinate. Okay? So if this first point, this end point here is negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That negative 7, negative 5 needs to be flip-flopped and you need to graph its inverse at negative 5, negative 7. There's our first one. Here's an interesting one. We have an x-intercept at 2, or at negative 2 rather. If your x-intercept is at negative 2 on the original function, then your y-intercept is going to be at negative 2 on the inverse. So negative 2, 0 becomes 0, negative 2. Any x-intercept becomes a y-intercept. And anything that used to be a y-intercept on the original, so there's a y-intercept of 2, becomes an x-intercept of 2. And then this is a critical point because there's a bend happening there. So that's at 1, 3. So we're going to graph 3, 1. And then the last point, so this all is a straight shot. And then the last point, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 7, 5 is going to go to 5, 7. Okay. What you should always get is a reflection over the diagonal line y equals x. That's what you're doing when you're flipping points. Your y equals x and x equals y, you're kind of flipping those points. So we get a reflection over that di horizontal or that um, diagonal y equals x. So state the range of f inverse. Obviously, we could look at the graph, but I want to make a bigger point here. If you look at your original function, in the original function, our domain was from negative 7 
up until 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, positive 7. That was our original domain, negative 7 to positive 7. Our original range was from negative 5 up until positive 5. Again, with the switches and the x's and the y's, your domain and ranges are just flipping. So when they ask for the range of the inverse, you're going to steal the numbers from the domain of the original. Okay? The range of the inverse is the same as the domain in the original. We're just going to use a y coordinate instead. Negative 7 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 7. And of course, if you look at your picture, it backs that up. <coughs> And what is the value of the inverse at negative 3? So there we will just look at our picture at negative 1, 2, 3. Our inverse has a point at negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So negative 5. So that's giving us the point on the inverse. That means the flip of that, negative 5, negative 3, should have been on the original. And you can just check that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, sure enough, was on the original. Okay? Number 6 gets at that symmetry that I just talked about. The graph of a function and the graph of its inverse always have symmetry across the line y equals x. Okay, that's that perfect diagonal. And I think that hits our inverse concepts. Any questions on inverses? Okay. Um, if we have time, I can throw some other, like, write the inverse of type questions for you for radical equations or um, quadratic equations, anything else that you might have to find the inverse for. Um, piecewise function g of x is given, and a separate function f of x, which has the greater average rate of change along the interval. Average rate of change is a pretty easy concept, okay? They're probably not going to give you something as straightforward as just find the average rate of change. They're always going to have you analyze and compute different rates of changes for different functions and then compare has been what, what I've seen on the few regences that they've put out there. So this is pretty typical. So to compare the rate of change on here and the rate of change on here, um, throwing a piecewise function at you is another little twist in there. So uh, when we're looking for the... It, average rate of change from negative 12 to 8 here. Again, these are our x coordinates, so we need to find the rest of our points first. So negative 12 comma something and 8 comma something on both graphs. Okay, the linear one's going to be easier, right? Plug in negative 12, you're going to get negative 24 plus 7, negative 17. Plug in 8, you're going to get 16 plus 7, 23. On the piecewise function, though, again, we have to decide which equation am I plugging negative 12 into, which piece. Does it fall in that piece, where x is less than 1, or this piece, where x is greater than or equal to 1? We're plugging in an x of negative 12. That is certainly less than 1. So we would plug negative 12 into this equation. Negative 12 over 3 is negative 4. Negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2. And then 8 is the x-coordinate we're plugging in second, and that certainly is greater than or equal to 1, so we plug in 8 to that equation. So 4 times 8 is 32, 32 minus 2 is 30. And so then we would calculate our slopes. 30 minus negative 2 is 32, 8 minus negative 12 is 20, and reduce that, those are what, divisible by 4. So I get 8 over 5. And here, 23 minus negative 17 is 40. 8 minus negative 12 is 20 again. That would be 2. Which one is bigger? 8 fifths or 2? Two? 2. Um, probably the instructions for that would say justify, not explain, because you you got to show a lot of work, so that's usually a justify one. Before I move on, I want to say one more thing about piecewise functions. The y-intercept is somewhat easy because what's the y-intercept of that is where x is 0. 
and x is 0 you just plug it into this interval. So for the y-intercept, not a big deal. For the x-intercept, that's a little bit trickier, okay? Because for an x-intercept, you set y equal to 0. So you don't really know which piece you're going to be using. And the truth is, you might be using both, you might be using none, or you might be using one. But you actually, if you're finding the x-intercept and you're making y 0, you actually have to look for the two potential uh, x-intercept. When I solve this one, I subtract 2 from both sides and then multiply by 3. Remember, this came from the first equation. And my x is negative 6. Is that or is that not in the proper interval for that problem? It is. So this would be an x-intercept. Okay? And if I look at the second one and I solve this and I add 2, I'm going to get 2 equals 4x, divide by 4 on both sides, and I get x equals 1 half for that one. Is that or is that not in that interval? It's not. So this one is not an actual x-intercept. It all depends on the answer that you get, whether or not that answer is in that interval. So what this piecewise function looks like is this first graph is 1 third x plus 2. So up 1 over 3 looks like this. But because it's a piecewise, it's cut off anywhere that x is less than 1. Or we're only keeping where x is less than 1. So we do get an x-intercept out of that one. That's why negative 6 works. Okay? On the second one, 4x minus 2, <coughs> you start at negative 2, rise 4, run 1, rise 4, run 1. It would look like this. But because we're only looking at the pieces greater than or equal to 1, so from here and beyond, we're losing that x-intercept. We had to reject it because the x-intercept of this line would have been 1 half, but that's out of interval from what we're looking at. Okay? So with the x-intercept, it's a little bit trickier. Y-intercept, you know x has to equal 0, just plug it into the appropriate one. You can only have and that's the other thing, you can only have one y-intercept. One place where x equals zero is a function. But you can have multiple x-intercepts on function, right? We see that all the time with our polynomial graphs where we kind of cross the x-axis a bunch of times. But we can't have multiple y-intercepts. That's clearly a problem. Okay? So, I think that might be it on piecewise functions um, that I would, that and maybe more will come up. But I didn't do, we didn't do like a separate section on piecewise functions. They just kind of get intermixed with everything else. Systems of three equations. This might be a little bit... Um, I don't know what, what way. I, I had Mrs. Zigai's kids last year that I now have an advanced pre-calc and a lot of them do substitution, whereas I only teach elimination. So if the way I do it's not the way you're comfortable with it, don't worry about it. Just do whatever way you like. But what I always tell my kids is look at your x coordinates, your y coordinates, and your z coordinates, or coefficients, I should be saying. Look at all of them and which ones are going to be easiest to get to be all the same. Okay? Because we want to, uh, we're going to do elimination three times. And the first two times, we're going to eliminate the same variable twice. In this case, I would definitely not say 3, 5, and 2. Because the least common multiple of those would be 30. The y's aren't bad, because I could make them all 10 pretty easily. And the z's are not so bad, because I could make them all 6 pretty easily. So we pick y's or z's just for the sake of picking one. I'm going to pick the z's. So the 2, the 6, and the 3, I'm going to make them all 6's. So this whole equation I'm going to multiply by 3. So I'll get 9x minus 15y plus 6z equals negative 5. And this one I'm not going to touch because it's already 6z. And this one I'm going to multiply by 2. And now they're all 6Zs. 
So I'm going to forget my original and I'm going to go with this. Okay? So here's where my elimination is going to come in twice. I'm going to take the first two equations and I'm going to eliminate my z's. And then I'll take my second two equations and I'm going to eliminate my z's. So on my first two equations, if they're both positive sixes, do I add or subtract to get positive six to cancel with positive six? Subtract. So I'm going to do nine minus five is four x. Negative fifteen minus one is negative sixteen y. 6z minus 6z, of course, is 0. And negative 5 minus 33 is negative 38. So I've eliminated my z's on the first two. And now I'm going to eliminate my z's on the second two. So when I look at a positive 6 and a negative 6, is adding those or subtracting those going to get them to cancel? Did I make a mistake? <gasps> You're the best. That would have been a doozy to get through this whole thing and have it be wrong. So negative 15 minus 33 is negative 48, right? Are we better? Have we saved it? How many people noticed that and we're, gonna, we're not going to speak up? Come on! You're killing me. That was been such a waste of time. Um, so if I add these two because they're opposite, I always tell my kids, same sign, subtract, opposite signs, add. So when I add 5x plus negative 4x is 1x, y plus 20 is 21y, 6 plus negative 6 is obviously 0, 33 plus 80 is 113. Okay, so I've done elimination twice. I've eliminated the same variable twice. And now I have two equations with two variables, which is just basic elimination. So I can either eliminate my y's, which have 16's and 21's in front of them. Ew, that doesn't look nice. Or my x's with a 4 and a 1. And that's going to be what I'm going to do. I'm going to eliminate my x's for my third round of elimination. So multiplying that by 4 is going to make, I'm going to keep my first equation the same. My second equation gets multiplied by 4, so I get 4x plus 84y equals 452. And then on my 4x's, I have the same sign, same sign, subtract, subtract, subtract. So negative 16 minus 84, negative 100y, negative 48 minus 452, negative 500, all is well. Y equals 5. And then it's a domino effect backwards. Go back to your previous step and use a Y of 5. So X plus 21 times 5 equals 113. So I'm going to take that 113 and subtract the 21 times 5 from it, and I'll get X equals 8. And then domino effect right back to... You could go to the beginning or you could go to the step prior. It doesn't really matter. I'll go, I'll go back to the, the beginning because these are smaller numbers. So negative 2 times 8 plus 10 times my new y value of 5 minus 3z equals 40. And so I'm going to add this 16 over. I'm going to subtract this 50 over and I get negative 3z equals 6. Divide by negative 3, z equals negative 2. This is Big Eyes Kids. Is that the way you do it? It is? Does anybody do substitution? You do both. You do whatever works for you. So, okay. I don't, I don't like... I only don't do substitution because, God forbid, none of these variables had, or God forbid, all of these variables had a coefficient other than 1. And let's say even that one was a 3y. Now to get a variable all by itself, you might be dealing with a lot of ugly fractions. And so it's not as foolproof to me as the elimination method. So like Jake, I only teach elimination. I don't even teach the other one because it's too messy. Um, and fractions make all of us think a little bit harder, me included. 
All right, so that's a system in three variables. The other type of system you guys are going to have to solve, which does have to be done by substitution, is when you're mixing two different types of functions. So I, I'm pretty positive I could say that the regents would always have a system with a linear and with a nonlinear. Okay? The, the three variables doesn't really fit into any category because they're not, they're not functions like things with x's and y's. But right now we have a linear and a circle. But I've seen linears and quadratics. I've seen linears and radicals. I've seen linears and rationals. It could be anything. The key is get a variable all by itself because this one is going to be substitution. So I'm pretty confident that they will make a variable easy enough to get by itself. And here obviously the y is easy to get by itself just by adding 2x. So if I add 2x to both sides, I can ditch that and use this system. And now it is just substitution. So since y equals 3 plus 2x, I'm plugging that in for the y up there. And from here it's just straight algebra, really crunching numbers. Make sure we square out the 3 plus 2x properly. So 3 plus 2x times 3 plus 2x. Some of us can do that all in our head. Some of us, it helps us to write it out so that we go through the foiling. Um, I'll go through the foiling just... And then what kind of equation has this resulted in? Is this a linear? What is it? Quadratic. Quadratic, get them equal to zero. So. I subtract the 18 over, and then I'm going to write it in proper form. I've got a total of 5x squared. That covers that and that. I have a total of 12x. That covers that and that. And 9 minus 18 is negative 9. Now, solving quadratics. Factoring or formula. Okay? I had a girl in Algebra 2 tell me yesterday that it wasn't factorable, and when it's not factorable, she doesn't know what to do. The formula always works. I agree that you should always try factoring first, but if factoring doesn't work, the quadratic formula always works. Okay, so, ooh, can anyone see if this is factorable right off the bat? It would have to be 5x and x. 9 and 1 is not going to work. 3 and 3. 3 and 3 will work. Because 1 gives me 15 and 1 gives me 3. I want a positive 15 and minus 3 will give me 12x. So my two x's, my two x solutions, are x equals 3 fifths and x equals negative 3, if I tee it up from there. Okay? When you're solving a system, you typically need the point. If you read again carefully, this actually only wants the y coordinate. We only have the x's right now. So we've done the majority of the work. We just have none of the answer yet. We're about to get it. We're just really one step away. To get the y coordinate that goes along with this x, we've got to plug that in. So y will equal 3 plus 2 times 3 fifths. 2 times 3 fifths is how many fifths? 6 fifths. And then when you maybe get a common denominator, you're going to get 15, 15 fifths plus 6 fifths is 21 fifths. So there's one y coordinate. And with the x coordinate of 3, y equals 3 plus 6 is 9. Oh, this kid's on fire. Bring him to advanced pre-calc. I need an audit every single day. So it is a negative 3, thank you. So it'll be 3 minus 6, which is negative 3. You're the best. All right. Um, what else do I want to say? You can obviously check your answer on a, on a calculator. You'd have to solve for y. Solving for y here, though, 
in order to check it on a calculator is going to be a little bit tricky. I'll do it quickly just so we see what we have to plug in the calculator. Subtract x squared from both sides, right? The calculator is all about y equals. The problem is when you take the square root of both sides, you always have a plus or minus. So in order to type in this function, well, it's not really a function because it's a circle, you have to plug it in into two parts. You'd have to plug in y equals the positive square root of 18 plus minus x squared, which will give you the top half of the circle. And you'd have to type in y equals negative, and it would give you the bottom half of the circle. And then your line would, of course, give you something through the circle and you could trace your points of intersection and see that your y coordinates are correct. I would recommend checking on the calculator once you're done with the rest of the test, obviously, but check on your calculator. I didn't say it here that you had to do it algebraically, but I'm 99% positive the um, regents will. If the regents doesn't say to solve the system algebraically, definitely just use your calculator, okay? I have seen uh, a problem where, God, what was it? Something like this. Something like that, and maybe like x squared plus y squared equals 8. It was an absolute value function and a circle. And, I mean, algebraically, I don't even know if I would know how to do Okay, like y equals this, you'd have to plug this in for y, but then you'd have a, a, an absolute value in there for that. Totally gross and ugly. And if you looked at the problem, it doesn't say to do it algebraically for that reason, because it's not going to work out nicely. And I don't even think we know how to do that. I'd have to play around with that for an hour before I figured it out. I know we don't teach it. So if it doesn't say algebraically, use your, use your calculator. Okay? All right. Um, we're getting into transformation. So we have a turning point at 5, negative 8 on f of x. g of x wants you to take f of x and do this all to it. Then which of the following is the new turning point of g of x? What does this x plus 7 do? What did you say? Left 7. So anytime moving left and right, which coordinate does that affect? The x coordinate. So if I move this left 7, where am I? Negative 2. Good. And what does this do? Down 3. And anytime I'm moving up or down, I'm affecting my y, negative 8, down 3, negative 11. So that's option 1. We jump to 10. f of x is shown in solid. So that's the one that opens up. g of x is shown dash. That's the one opening down. Which of the following equations describes the relationship between the two functions? Okay. There is definite, definitely a vertical flip here, right? So which one shows a vertical flip? Which one or which ones show a vertical flip? Two. The only one that has a negative out in front. So save yourself time there. There's only one option. But just for the sake of review, what did this one suggest happened? Down six. This one, not only does it say it reflected vertically, but what does a one-half multiplier out in front do? vertically compresses it, okay? I always tell my kids anything anything outside the function, whether it's in front or after, is all vertical. So if that's plus or minus, that's shifting. If it's multiplying, that's stretching or compressing. And if it's a negative, that's vertically flipping. Anything that happens inside the function is all horizontal. So if you have like a plus 5 in here, that shifts it five units horizontally. If you have a three out in front, that dilates it horizontally by three, right? And if you have a negative on the inside, that flips something horizontally versus vertically. So anything outside is vertical, anything inside is horizontal, and the crazy thing about everything horizontal is that it's 
the opposite of what you would your your logic and your common sense would tell you, right? Plus five on the inside, you would think means move to the right five. But we pretty soon find out that that actually means left five. If you're multiplying by the whole number three on the inside, we would think that that should be a stretch. You're multiplying it by three, but in reality, it's actually compressing it by a factor of a third, right? So those numerical things horizontally happen backwards. So this one here out in front means it's vertical. It's a multiplier, which means it's a dilation. So it's a stretch by two. This one, it's inside the function, so it's horizontal. It's a multiplier, which means it's a dilation. And it's one half, which actually means it's stretching by two, because there's that funky thing happening horizontally. Okie doke. All right. I like the way 11 is phrased. Not, not I like it. I just think it's an interesting twist on it. So they give you the original function. And they tell you the x-intercepts of that original function, negative 9 and 3. Where would this one then have its x-intercepts? Okay, so if this one is f of x, this one is f of what? What did they plug in in place of the x? 3x. Okay, so from f of x to f of 3x, is it horizontal or vertical? Horizontal, it's inside the function. Is it a dilation or a shift? Dilation. Is it a stretch or a compression? Compression, right? It's horizontal, it's happening backwards of what you would think. So it's a compression by a factor of three. So the x that used to be negative nine now got pulled into where? What's a third of negative nine? Negative three. The x-intercept that used to be a 3 got brought in by a third of that, which would put you at 1. So the whole thing got horizontally smushed in towards the y-axis. And so our new x-intercepts are negative 3 and 1. Okay? Same thing with transitioning your domains and ranges. Here's our old domain. Here's our old range. The new function has a lot going on. Which of these transformations should I address first? The 5, the negative, or the 3? The negative. You want to follow order of operations like you would anything else. So you want to go inside the function and grab that negative. So it's inside the function, that's horizontal. It's negating it, so it's flipping it, right? So horizontal anything affects which one, the domain or the range? Domain. So it's flipping it. So my domain is now going to be switched from negative 10 up until positive 5. Okay? So rather than, from, than going from negative 5 to 10, it's going from positive 5 to negative 10. So that covers the negative. Then which transformation comes next, the 5 or the 3? The 5. Is that horizontal or vertical? Vertical. Is it a shift or a dilation? Dilation. And so is it a stretch or compression more specifically? Stretch. Very good. So it's a Y thing, so it's affecting the range. So stretching that by 5 is going to now change our range to Y is less than or equal to 75. 15 times 5 is 75. And then the plus 3, is that horizontal or vertical? Vertical, shift or dilation? Up or down? Up 3. So that's going to turn into y is less than or equal to 78. Okay? Well, how we do, and we got two more pages left, and we have half an hour. Feeling good? All right, um, we have an original function. They're asking us to draw the transformation, just like with inverses. When I draw any transformation, I want to focus on the critical points. So that could be any endpoint or corner point, x-intercepts, y-intercepts, if you want. Okay. Sometimes you might feel like you need a little bit more. So what is this doing? with a negative 2 out in front. 
horizontal or vertical? Vertical. Um, dilation, translation, or reflection? Dilation and a reflection. The multiplier by two is your dilation, your stretch of two, and your reflection is coming from the negative. So they're both vertical. I would, it doesn't really matter to me, you could stretch it first and then reflect it, you can reflect it and then stretch it. This order of operations does not matter. So let's say I will stretch it first by two. So if this is two below the x-axis, I'm doubling that distance and it's going to become four below. If you're zero units away from the x-axis and you double that, you're still zero units away from the x-axis, yes? So anything that's on the x-axis is going to stay fixed there if you're stretching or compressing vertically. This next point was 3 above. I'm going to double that. So now it's 6 above. Same thing with this next one. It was 3 above. It's going 6 above. This one on the x-axis is staying fixed. And this one that's 3 below is going 4, 5, 6 below. So I'm going to... There's my stretch. Now I'm flipping everything, right? So this is 4 below. I'm going to put it 4 above. If you're on the x-axis, you're staying on the x-axis. This one was 6 above. I'm going 6 below. The next one was 6 above. I'm going 6 below. This one on the x-axis stays on the x-axis. And then this one, which was 6 below, is going 6 above. One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. Oops. I missed it. I think I would then always suggest that you erase your intermediate step there. Or maybe only do it really lightly at first. And definitely label the graph that you want to be your G function. So definitely label that. And then solve the equation for f of x equals g of x for all x values. So they just want the x values where your f of x function equals your g of x function. And that's obviously happening where they cross at an x-coordinate of negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and an x-coordinate of 1, 2, 3. Okay? Any questions on that? All right. Polynomials. Switching gears here. We're done with transformations. Um, we have a cubic polynomial. We're asked to answer the following. Find the x-intercepts. X-intercept is when what equals what? Y equals 0. So 0 equals x cubed minus 5x squared minus 4x plus 20. This one does say algebraically. And I hope this one is, is groupable because here's the thing. If it's not groupable, they need to give you a factor to start dividing out long division like we did a little bit earlier. And since they're not giving me anything, it better be factorable because otherwise they're giving you a problem you really can't do. So we'll try the grouping. Pull out an x squared. We're left with x minus 5. Pull out a negative 4. We're left with x minus 5. And because those match, it was groupable. We can pull out an x minus 5 now. And we're left with x squared minus 4. And you can tee it up here or you could keep factoring, right? x squared minus 4 is x plus 2 or x minus 2. So you have x-intercepts at 5, negative 2, and positive 2. Okay, simple enough. Explain why the graph below could not represent that of f of x. I, I don't know about 
the sophomores in here, but I can speak for the juniors and say that their writing of sentences to explain is horrific. I don't know if yours is any better or worse, but we have a tough time definitely writing sentences in math. Is that true? To find the right words. Um, make sure your sentences make sense. Okay, so there's so many times I read a sentence and I'm like, what? Like, is that, that's not English. And I think anyone would read it later and be like, I don't even know what I was trying to say. But you've got to be able to communicate at the end of the day. And don't lose a point because you're not writing a sentence that makes sense. If that means you have to write a paragraph for it to make sense, then write a paragraph. Um, because I think that may be it, was we're trying to say it quickly and we can't, we can't get it all in one sentence. So explain why this graph could not represent this one. Yeah. Perfect. That would be one, one reason. I could think of another one as well. So just let me just um, summarize what he said. This is a cubic function, so you could say f of x is a cubic function, it's only supposed to have three zeros. This one really only does have three zeros, but I know what you're saying, and, I, and you would get credit for that because you mentioned the bounce. This one has, has three zeros, but one of them has a multiplicity of two. Do you guys talk about multiplicity? Okay, one of them has a multiplicity of two, so the degree of this function is actually four, right? Two, three, four. Okay, that would be one. What would be the other way, thing, way you could explain? The function is odd. Yep. The function has an odd degree, but the end behavior is indicative of an even degree, right? The end behavior, the fact that they both end going towards positive infinity, brings us right back to that first page, okay? We have an odd degree function written, but yet it, it's looking like one of those. So you would say just exactly that. So the function is clearly an odd degree with a degree of 3, but the end behavior here, since they're both ending towards positive infinity, must be an even degreed function. Don't say even function, because we're talking about degrees here. These are even degree and odd degree issues, not even function and odd function. That's the symmetry kind, okay? All right, writing equations for polynomials. This is bound to be on there somehow. And so I'm going to start by giving you the format, which is always y equals some a leading coefficient, and then it's going to be x minus root 1 raised to the multiplicity of root 1, and then x minus root 2 raised to the multiplicity of root 2, dot, dot, dot. That's going to go on for as many roots as you possibly have. Is that better? Okay. So this particular example is one of the harder ones because I gave you a root at 3, and that's fine. Um, but I also gave you a root at 2 plus 3i. So we've got the ima an imaginary issue going on here. And what do you know about imaginary roots? Anybody? They always come in conjugate pairs. So what you should immediately do is add on your third root, which is x equals 2 minus 3i. Okay? Now, we don't have a multiplicity issue here. So for that reason, we don't have to worry about exponents of 2 or 3. 2, God forbid they ever did a triple root on you and you had to do, raise something to the third power. But a is always the very last thing you're going to find. Okay, the first thing you're going to do is plug in all your roots. So we've got y equals a times, if you have a root of 3, that's x minus 3. And again, all these multiplicities are to the first power, so don't have to worry about that. With your imaginary roots, you have to be careful because your root is a binomial. And when you subtract a binomial, you need to keep it in parentheses so that you don't forget to distribute. So x minus 
zoom in there, x minus the 2 plus 3i root, and x minus the 2 minus 3i root. Now, I always tell my kids, if there's imaginaries involved, multiply them out first, so you have to do it once, and then you're done with it. Do not plug in x, y right now. Okay? Do not plug in the point 2, negative 18 for x and y just yet. Let's iron out the imaginaries first, and then we'll worry about that. Okay? If there weren't imaginaries here, I would say plug in your point next. Be done with it. But because there's imaginaries, there's a little bit of grossness here we want to clean up. So if I'm just switching up these two, before I get started, I'm going to distribute the negatives in each case. So x minus 2 minus 3i and x minus 2 plus 3i. Now, you can multiply this out trinomial times trinomial, which I'm not going to do because there's obviously a more efficient way I'm going to show you. You can do x times x, x times negative 2, x times positive 3i. Negative 2 times x, negative 2 times, right? That would be the trinomial times trinomial method which would be three, six, nine rounds of multiplication and a whole lot of combining, right? But what's always going to happen with uh, these conjugate pairs of imaginary is these are conjugates in and of themselves. So you have x minus 2 minus 3i and x minus 2 plus 3i. So when I multiply, I can kind of treat this as one term and x minus 2 times x minus 2 Hopefully, we can do in our head pretty easily. Can we do that in our head pretty easily? x squared minus 4x four plus 4? Okay. Some people are better than that at others, but you should be able to square a binomial, aka multiply a binomial by itself, in your head, or you should be, especially those of you coming to me next year, you should be able to multiply x minus 2 times x minus 2 in your head. So I'm kind of treating this as a first term, times the first term, which is going to give me x squared minus 4x plus 4. And then the beauty of conjugates, the thing that we capitalize on the most, is that the outer and the inner when you're foiling conjugates cancel. So the x minus 2 times the positive 3i and the x minus 2 times the negative 3i is going to cancel. So I'm just going to not do that step at all and then negative 3i times positive 3i is negative 9i squared. If you, if you see that shortcut and you kind of see that organization and that makes sense to you, <clears throat> go ahead and do it. If not, go through the nine different sets of multiplications just to be perfect, okay? I wouldn't try to force this if that doesn't make any sense to you. <coughs> but what happens to this? Minus 9i squared is the same as plus 9. So y equals a times x minus 3, and this whole thing is going to become x squared minus 4x, and then plus 4 plus 9 is plus 13. So I'm done with the imaginary. I've worked them out. Now I go plug in 2 and negative 18, just temporarily, to help me find a. So I'm going to zoom out here and go over here. I'm going to plug in negative 18 for y equals a is what I'm looking for. I have 2 minus 3 and then 2 squared minus 4 times 2 plus 13. And I'm going to clean this up. a times this is negative 1. This is 9. So this is negative 9. Divide both sides by negative 9. And I get 2 equals A. And so A of 2 just goes back into here. And uh, let me see. Y equals 2 times x minus 3 times x squared minus 4x plus 13. 
if they don't specify um, like how to write your final answer, like you, you could be done right here. That's, that's an equation, okay? But here I did just to be a pain in the butt, because sometimes that's what the uh, Regents does to us, is I did say write the equation for a polynomial. In order to write this as a polynomial, we actually need to multiply that all out. Okay, so it's just algebra one, but if it does say polynomial form, if it doesn't say polynomial form, leave it. Because we don't want you to do, you, we don't want you to have a perfect answer here and make a silly mistake multiplying it out and then get it wrong because you went too far. Had you just stopped, you would have had the right answer. But just for the sake of going through, this would be 2x minus 6. And then I'm just going to multiply binomial times trinomial. So 2x times x squared, 2x cubed. 2x times negative 4x, negative 8x squared. 2x times 13, 26x. Move on to your negative 6. Negative 6x squared plus 24x minus 78. All right, we're just about done. Y equals 2x cubed minus 14x squared plus 50x minus 78. They suggested it should be a third degree polynomial. Mine's a third degree polynomial. Okay? Mine's a third degree polynomial with a positive coefficient. So it should start low and I don't care what happens in the middle, and end high. And so I would just use your calculator to check because it's going to help, obviously, point out any mistake that you might have made. 2x to the third uh, minus 14x squared plus 50x minus 78. Graph it. And, of course, I'm negative... I'm negative 100 to 200, so mine's a little zoomed out, but if I zoom 6 and go back to my... Well, now that doesn't give me a great... Now that's too close, but if you went somewhere in between, you can still already see the positive odd behavior. Dark low end pi. I don't like that either. Now I'm just being picky. Negative 10 to 10. good enough. We see it. Okay. And we see the one real root. The other two roots are imaginary. That's why we don't see them. Okay. Kind of a random topic. Identities. Okay. Here's the thing with an identity. And if I have a minute, again, I'll show you one that was on one of the reasons recently. But with an identity, if you are proving or trying to show whether or not something is correct or not, you simplify the left and you simplify the right without kind of without doing anything on this side you simplify here without doing anything on this side you simplify here and if they match it's an identity and if they don't they don't one thing you can't do like if this ever said <coughs> divided by three one thing you can't do with an identity is you can't multiply both sides by three okay that's a solving technique that is not an identity proving technique. When you are proving, you have to treat both sides completely, completely separately. So you cover this up and simplify this, cover this up and simplify that. And I, if, again, like I said, if I have time, I'll pull up a question that was on last June's region where kids didn't get full credit because they kind of solved a little bit instead of just keeping it to, to simplifying. So just here on the right, we're just multiplying x cubed minus x squared y plus xy squared plus another x squared y minus xy squared plus y cubed. And we get x cubed, that cancels, that cancels, plus y cubed on the left. And this left-hand side was already, oh, that was on the right. This left-hand side already is simplified, and then check. You answer the question, say yes. 
and then your justification is in your work. Okie doke. All right. Uh, last, last page. So, rational expression given can be written as some polynomial plus k over x minus 5, where p of x is a quadratic polynomial and k is a constant. Determine what p of x is. What am I going to do here to figure out p of x? Yep, long division. You're actually going to do the long division. The remainder is k. So x minus 5. Now this hasn't come up today, but it will. If the polynomial that you're dividing ever skips a term, so if you have an x cubed and then you skip an x squared, you want to fill your x squared with like plus 0x squared so everything stays lined up. Do you guys do that when this is a guy? Okay. So I have 4x cubed minus 2x squared plus 8x plus 10. And I'll just go through. x times 4x squared gives me 4x cubed minus 20x squared. I'm, do you guys kind of like long division? Easy for you? I would think, yeah. So I'm just going to fly through this. Negative 2 plus 20 is 18x squared. Bring down your 8x. You get plus 18x. 18x squared minus 90x. Do your subtraction. 98x plus 10 plus 98. Did I do something wrong? Or did you all get the bigger numbers than I got? I'm suspicious. Did you guys get this? 10 minus 490? Negative 480? That seems humongous. Let me check my work quickly here. Where's my professional auditor? Did he get this? Oh, that's wrong. It should be 10 minus negative 490, so 10 plus 490 is 500. Right? You guys got all 500? So it just must be a big number. I'm immediately suspicious, just like you probably are when something crazy like that happens. Um, but I think it is 500. So determine the equation for P of X. That's right there. So your answer is 4X squared plus 18X plus 98 plus the 500 remainder over x minus 5. Whoops, can't see that. So, what is p of x? p of x equals this 4x squared plus 18x plus 98. And of course, we already showed how we arrived at our answer. Is x minus 5 a factor? Yes or no? No, because there's a remainder other than 0. And last one. Okay, we have a cubic polynomial with zeros at negative 4 and 6. And only passes through the point 236 as shown. Algebraically determine its equation in factored form. So this is exactly what we already did, except for now I don't have imaginary roots, but I have a double root that we're dealing with. So your format, again, is y equals a times x minus r1 to the multiplicity of 1, x minus r2 times whatever the multiplicity of that root is, and so on. So because we have a root at negative 4, our factor is x plus 4. And that root there is our double root. So that gets squared. And then our other root is at 6, so we do x minus 6, and that has a multiplicity of 1. This one's going to be easier than the other one because we don't have to deal with that imaginary nonsense. Okay? I can immediately plug in my point, 236.
I get 6 squared, which is 36. 2 times negative, or 2 minus 6 is negative 4. So, first of all, I could multiply this all out and divide both sides by it. Or I can see that the 36 kind of cancel right away. And then when I divide by negative 4 on both sides, I just get that A equals negative 1 fourth. Just don't forget to go back and actually write your equation with the A in there. Remember, almost everything was done here except for I needed to find the A. So my final answer is Y equals negative 1 fourth X plus 4 squared and X minus 6. And remember, this one said to keep it in factored form. This is a third degree polynomial, yes? Degree of 2, degree of 1, 2 plus 1 is 3. The coefficient is negative. Look at your picture. Should it have been negative? Yes. Okay. Um, bear with me one second and let me show you the question on that identity that I was talking about from last June, if I can. That's 3, that's 4, I think it's going to be. June 2016. Is this the one? Yes, right here. Um, they wanted us to prove this. And I want to show you what a lot of kids did and show you why it's wrong. So, a lot, a lot of kids looked at this and saw, okay, it's a rational equation, but it was to prove. All right, so they got a common denominator. They put it over 1 on the right. Here's the equal sign. So they give this an x cubed plus 8, and they gave this an x cubed plus 8, and then they all went like that. The fact that you can cross out denominators in an equation is because that's a method of solving, right? If we were to solve this, then once you get a common denominator on every single term, you can cross that out. And so they did that, and they lost the point, because that is not, that is not, the question is not to solve, the question is to prove. So proving, again, means simplify this side as much as you can. And simplifying a fraction never means cross out the denominator. That is, again, a skill that's just for solve, or uh, uh, something, a technique that you would do just for solving. So first, simplifying the left, they should have just left this alone. Don't touch it. I totally get why they all crossed out the denominator, but they were kind of not clear to me, it seems, that and they weren't clear what proved me. Simplify the left, which is done. Now on the right-hand side, we have x cubed plus 8 plus 1 all over x cubed plus 8. So you've got the common denominator so that now in your numerator, you can take this numerator and add this numerator, and it's that. And then one more step of simplifying is x cubed plus 9 over x cubed plus 8. Check. Okay? But a lot of them ended up with x cubed plus 9 equals x cubed plus 9. Okay? And that's not okay. Because technically what we're doing when we say just cross out all your denominators, what we're technically doing is if they all have a denominator of x cubed plus 8 now, we're technically multiplying both sides by x cubed plus 8. So that it cancels on the left and it cancels the two on the right. That's technically what we're doing. You don't ever show that because it seems like a waste of time. And we just say, once you get all the same denominator, cross them out. But we are technically multiplying both sides by something. And any time you're doing the same thing to both sides, that's a solving technique as opposed to a proving technique. Does that make sense? Okay. So that one was such an easy question. But we couldn't give a lot of people two points on it because they did that. And that, that's not the proof. So try to stay with it. Definitely stay within the left, simplify, don't even look at the right. Stay within the right, simplify the right, don't even look at the left. Cross your fingers that they're equal. Okay? If it says to prove that they're equal, then it should work out. If it says determine whether or not it's an identity, well, then you've got a yes or no question for you. Okay? Any questions? All right. On the marathon, huh? Is that helpful? Good. Okay. So I'm like, I'm not sure exactly. Oh, I do know what next week is because I'm doing that one too. 
And then the week after that, I think it's like sequences and series and like some of that other, you know, weird stuff. Um, but that was just some topics. If you think of any topics that you want review on, just let me know and I will try to throw them in next week.